exploration founded by Gregory Stem that specialized in salvaging shipwrecks from the ocean floor. In what the company codenamed Black Swan, they retrieved the gold and silver from what they claimed was an undisclosed location in international waters. It turns out that the coins were recovered from a 200-year-old shipwreck from the Spanish ship Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. Uh, which was sunk on October 5th, 1804, during the Battle of Cape Santa Maria by the British Royal Navy. The lost treasure that they had recovered is believed to be worth more than $500 million. Unfortunately, Odyssey was sued by the Spanish government who claimed that the treasure legally belonged to them and accused Odyssey of illegal looting. And after a five-year legal battle, including making its way up to the Supreme Court, Odyssey was forced to turn over the treasure to the Spanish government and was left with nothing. Could you imagine finding a $500 million treasure and you don't get to keep any of it? I don't know about you, but whenever since I was a little kid, I always dreamed of going on a treasure hunt. Just like the adventure of sailing across the open sea and right, solving riddles and puzzles and following a, a treasure map while hiking through the jungle to stumble upon all of this. Um, right? And th this idea has been immortalized by movies like Indiana Jones, which are some of the greatest movies ever made, except for the fourth one. We don't count the fourth movie. Just stick to the first three. Uh, and other, other movies like National Treasure and Pirates of the Caribbean and, of course, The Goonies. If you've never seen that one, you need to watch that. That, that one's a classic. Uh, and I think as an, as an adult, the fantasy has kind of shifted more towards the idea of stumbling across an endless amount of money without having to actually work for it. That's, that's just as appealing as the, the treasure of finding it. But there's a reason that lost treasures have been the subject of storytellers all throughout human history, including Jesus. So we've been going through a series called Story Time with Jesus, where we look at some of the parables that Jesus taught from. And today we're going to pick up right where we left off last week in Matthew chapter 13. Um, so if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew 13. Um, and today we are going to actually look at two parables, uh, two very short parables that are found in verses 44, 45, and 46. And the reason we're covering two is because these two small stories are basically the same story that takes slightly different forms, but try to communicate the same thing. Um, so if we start reading in verse 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The second story is in verse 45 and 46. It says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search for fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So in order to understand these two stories from the perspective of the original audience that Jesus was talking to, we need to understand a little something about banks. Because banks, fun fact, banks have been around for almost 4,000 years, right? Sometime right around the time of Abraham was when the first banks were created. But the idea that we have of a savings account where you can put your money into the bank for safekeeping didn't exist until about 500 years ago. And it wasn't until after the, uh, the stock market crash of 1928 that led to the Great Depression that the federal government started uh, securing bank accounts. Or they would, uh, they would they'd promise that whatever was put in there was insured and that you were guaranteed to get your money back. So for all of human history, there has always been people that are willing to lend you money if it means that they get to make money off of the interest, right? That's about as old as civilization is. But for people in the first century, 
they had no idea of the concept of a savings account, of, of putting money into the bank to keep it. So if you were a person that had some wealth and you wanted to keep that money safe and you couldn't put it in the bank, so you really had two options. The first is what we see in verse 44, where they would literally just bury their treasure in the ground. It was a common practice back then that if you wanted to keep your money safe, you would just dig a hole and put it in the ground and cover it back up, or maybe you'd find a cave or something. But the idea is you put it in a location that you can easily retrieve the money whenever you want, but no one else would be able to just stumble across it and find it. And obviously, there would be occasions where I guess somebody might potentially forget about it, but I don't know how you forget about where you bury treasure, but much more likely, people would die before ever having the chance to go back and retrieve their treasure to pass down to their children or whatever they wanted to do with it. And so it, it did actually happen all throughout history that people would just stumble across buried treasure. And so the man in this story, it says he was, uh, right, all it says is that he, f or in, he found treasure hidden in a field. So this man was probably what we call a tenant farmer, uh, meaning that he was a farmer, but he did not have any land of his own. So he would lease or rent a plot of land from a wealthier landowner, and then he would farm his crops, and then at harvest time, he would give a cut of the crops, or at least the proceed of the, co the crops, to the landowner as payment for letting him use this man's land so he could feed his own family. And so while he was plowing this land, he stumbles across this treasure. But during Roman, or under Roman law, um, finders keepers was not the law. If you found treasure on someone else's land, the landowner was the rightful owner of that treasure. And so if it got found out, they would force you to turn it over. Just like this company that found the $500 million in treasure, they had to give it all over. So what does this guy do? He puts the treasure back where he founds it, puts the dirt down, and makes it look like nothing happens, and he doesn't tell anyone. And then it says, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Right? So he sells his belonging. He, he goes to the landlord and says, I'll give you an offer you can't refuse. And he purchases the field from the landowner. So now that treasure is legally his. Right? And so then you just wait a little bit so it's not too obvious. And, oh, look, I just happened to stumble across this treasure that's worth far more than this land that I just bought. How lucky am I? Now, imagine that conversation with his wife when he got home. Like, hey, honey, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I need you to trust me. We have to sell the house. The car's got to go. The dog's got to go. Oh, by the way, I'm going to need your wedding ring. But trust me, right, when we're all done with this, I will buy you the biggest diamond ring you have ever seen in your entire life. And then they turned into the Beverly Hillbillies. Right? So that treasure was more important to that man than everything else that he owned. And I said there's two things that you can do with your money. The first one we saw in verse 44, where if you can't put it in the bank, so you just bury it in the ground. The second option that you have to keep your money safe in the ancient world is you just keep it on your person at all times, especially if you're, you're traveling around a lot, you just keep it on you. Uh, however, they didn't have paper money that you can just put in a wallet like we would today. Right? They didn't have credit cards, obviously. And hauling around a giant chest full of gold would be a little inconvenient, and it also make you the target of any robbers that you happen to face while you're, while you're traveling down the road. So what people would often do is they would trade their valuables and their possessions for something of the same worth, but something that is much smaller that can either be worn on your body or concealed on your person, such as fine jewelry or pearls. So that's what we see here in the second story in verses 44 and 45. It says this man, he's a merchant. So he's, he's doing all right for himself, right? He probably would have been fairly wealthy. And he was a merchant who specialized in pearls. And so he would travel all over the, the Roman Empire probably in search for fine pearls that he could then buy and sell. 
And so while he's searching for these pearls, he comes across this one pearl that's so large and so beautiful that he says, I just have to have that one. And so he trades his entire collection, all the other pearls that he would have been, that probably would have bought so far, right? Everything that he owns, the shirt off his own back, everything that he has to his name, he trades for this one pearl, right? So again, the moral of the story here is that that pearl was more valuable to that man than everything else that he owns, right? That's what treasure really is, right? Something you treasure is something that you're willing to sacrifice everything else in order to get. And this is what Jesus compares to the kingdom of heaven. And we mentioned this last week. The kingdom of heaven is not just some place that you go to after you die, right? The kingdom of heaven is not, right, this place where there's little fat baby angels in diapers with wings floating around on clouds playing the harp for all of eternity, right? The kingdom of heaven is essentially the rule and reign as Jesus Christ as our king. And right, the kingdom of heaven exists right now, right? To be part of the kingdom of heaven means that you subject yourself to the rule of Jesus, right? That I'm no longer the master of my life, but Jesus is whatever he says I'm going to do because I value him more than myself, Essentially, the kingdom of heaven, or essentially, right, uh, the, the greatest treasure that we can have is knowing Christ Jesus, right? That Jesus is a treasure that is more valuable than everything else that the world has to offer. Because in Jesus, there is more joy, there is more pleasure, there is more satisfaction, more comfort, security and delight to be found in Christ than the sum of everything else that the world has to offer. The world's GDP, the gross domestic product, uh, which basically means if you take the, the economies of every nation in the world and you combine them together, is equal to $42 trillion. That's 42 with nine zeros after it. Jesus is more valuable than all of that combined. I think one of the, the greatest pictures of really what it looks like to, to treasure Christ, right, that we're willing to forego everything else in order to have him, is the Apostle Paul. And he talks about this in Philippians chapter 3. Last year we walked verse by verse through the entire book of Philippians. Um, and we covered this section in quite detail, or in a lot of detail. Uh, but I want to read these verses again in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. Right? Listen, listen to the, the attitude that Paul has towards Christ. He says, But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. I love that word. We need to use rubbish more often. Right? In order that I might gain Christ. Now, if you know anything about Christ's, or about Paul's past, right, before he became a Christian, he was a Pharisee, and he went by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And by every measure that you would define success by in the ancient world, especially for a Jewish man, Paul had reached all of that. He was highly educated. Uh, he would have been very financially stable in his job. He was well-respected by everyone around him. Right, Paul had built a very good life for him, and he loved what he did. And then he encountered Jesus, and he was willing to throw all of that away in order to have Jesus. He walked away from his job as a Pharisee. He walked away from, from his society, from all of his friends. Right? Everybody he knew turned his back on him. He took a, he took a, a second job as a tent maker, literally sewing tents, in order to get enough money to, uh, to be able to go on these missionary trips where he would travel around the world and preach the gospel to people who then would turn around and chase him out of the city. He was hunted, he was beaten, he was arrested, and ultimately he had his head chopped off because of what he taught about Jesus. And Paul says every bit of it was worth it. 
and he would do it over and over and over again because of the surpassing now or the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord right simply having Jesus having a relationship with Jesus is worth more than anything else that Paul could have gotten in his life right that is what Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is about. By the way, I mentioned, right, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is right now, but someday there's going to be a future, literal, physical kingdom where Jesus will return, he will judge everyone, and he, we will get to rule with him. Look at Revelation 20, verse 4. He says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ Jesus for a thousand years. Right? That is our treasure. That is what we are after. Not only do we get to have a relationship with God, but we get to reign with him as our king. Right? That's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And that's what we should treasure above everything else. Again, Christ is a treasure that is worth more than anything that this world has to offer. To know him, to be with him, to be forgiven by him, and to have him reign over us is a treasure worth chasing after. But now let's get a little more practical, right? What does it actually look like for us as first century Americans to truly treasure Christ above everything else? Well, the first one is the obvious one that you could probably guess that I was going to go there, right? That we need to treasure Christ more than our money. Right? So what does it look like to treasure Christ more than our money? Um, ma er, uh, Matthew 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? The thing that your heart most desires, that is your treasure. And for a lot of us, it's money. Um, but interesting enough, in the parallel passage in Luke, where he, Luke gives his account of Jesus telling the story, he, starts, he, sa he says the same thing that was said in Matthew 6, but he starts by saying, sell your possessions and give to the needy. One way to treasure Christ more than your money is to give it away. Lots of people have done this and have found great joy in doing so. However, giving away everything and living in poverty for Christ is not the only way that you can treasure Christ with your money. Right? To which everybody's like, whew, oh, thanks. Right? But the, what this means, to treasure Christ more than our money, means that we have to shift our perspective on how we think about money. If money is the end goal, then that has become your treasure. Instead, as Christians, we need to view money as a tool that we can use to bring glory to God and to build up his kingdom. Right? We have to realize that your money doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God, and he has entrusted you to be a good steward to take care of that while you are here. And when we realize that, right, it's not my money, it's his, right, then I'm going to spend it in ways that he wants. Not just about collecting all of the stuff that I want, but how can I use my money for his good? And here's the cool thing, that when you take your focus off of money and put it onto the kingdom of God, God tends to bless you with more money. Not always, and, right, and every one of us will go through seasons where we have more and we have less, but the Bible says that he who is faithful over a little will be given much. Right? But if your focus is only on money, why would God give you more money if he knows that that's the thing that's going to pull you away from him? Right? But we have to treasure Christ more than our money. Here's a tough one. How do we treasure Christ more than your spouse. There's like, right, a lot of people like, oh, the most important thing to me is my wife or my husband. Right? And that, 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 that's a good sentiment, but to, or, but to treasure Christ more than your spouse means that, Kirsten, my wife is not the most important thing in my life. She's the second most important thing. 
right? But again, we have to shift our perspective on this. Because do you realize that when you get to heaven, you're not going to be married anymore? Right? Marriage is a contract that ends when one of you dies. Then you're, you're no longer in that marriage anymore, which means mar- marriage is a temporary thing that God has given us. Right? So my wife is not the most important thing to me, but my wife is a beautiful gift that God has given me in order to help shape me into a better man and a better follower of Jesus. And it's my responsibility as her husband to help shape her into a better follower of Jesus and a better woman. And together, as a team, we work together to help show our children what it looks like to be a better follower of Jesus. Right? That's how you treasure Christ more than your spouse. Right? And when you put that into perspective, when they become number two, you actually become a better husband and wife if, than if you make them the most important thing. Because if you, right, wi- husbands and wives are a great blessing from God, but they make terrible gods themselves. If they become the object of your worship, you're in trouble because they cannot live up to that expectation. Right? But when God is your treasure and they are right, a, a helpmate that God has given you to reach that treasure, then everything works much better. How about another one? Let's get this even harder, right? How do we treasure Christ more than our children? I've met a lot of people, mostly mothers, that, that actually at least will express this out loud. That this way, I could never love anything more than my children. Here's the thing. We're not asking you to stop loving your children, right? God never does that. But when we treasure Christ more than our children, once again, it puts our children into perspective on how we view them and how we are willing to raise them, right? So as a father, it is my job to model the love that God has given for me to them, right? I am supposed to teach them what the love of God looks like by the way in which I treat them. Thank God for grace because we don't do a very good job of that sometimes, do we? Uh, right, but then it's also our job to realize that God's plan for their lives is better than ours. Right, how many of you, or, or, or parents, especially if you've got adult children, how many of you had all these great plans on what you thought your child was going to do? Those plans come through? Probably not. But we have to trust that God has a plan for their life. And whatever God's plan is, probably a whole lot better than anything that we can come up with. I've met a lot of young people who were very passionate about ministry and, and training up to, to go into to serve God in various ways, and then their parents were, were resisting it because, like, oh, you can't become a missionary. That's, that's dangerous. You, you, can't, you can't go work at a church. That's not going to pay you enough, right? How are you going to be able to, to provide for all of your needs doing that? Right? It's not trusting that what God's plan has for them is better. Right? So can, can we trust that by treasuring Christ more than our children, that it means we're, things aren't in our control? But Christ is supposed to be the king over our lives. It's in his control. And that works out much better than ours. Right? That's, those are just some of the, we can go on for a long time about what does it mean to treasure Christ. But I just want to leave you with this one quote. He says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I don't know if any of you ever heard that quote before. That was given by a man named Jim Elliott, who was a missionary to Ecuador, who he and his friends were trying to reach the Harani tribe. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, but so after he, he and his team were for, for weeks and months, were, were trying to make contact with this tribe in Ecuador that no outside person had ever been able to reach. And the reason is because they were cannibals and anybody that would come close, they would just kill and eat. Um, and so after weeks and months of, they would take their plane and, and circle around the tribe and just trying to make their, their, their presence known to them and, and trying to like drop gifts and baskets out of the airplane to show that they're, they're friendly. They finally one day decided they were going to land their plane on the banks of the river outside of the tribe. And when they did that, the men came from the tribe came out and speared them all to death. When, they, when a, a team went to recover their bodies, they found in the airplane they had firearms with them. And they chose not to fight back because they knew that would defeat everything they were trying to accomplish. 
And those men valued the kingdom of God, right, of reaching this tribe for the gospel more than they valued their own lives. And sometimes, sometime later, Jim's wife, Elizabeth, and the other widows of the men who died returned to that same location and were able to reach that tribe for the gospel. The men, the men and women that murdered their husbands, they were able to forgive, to witness to, to disciple, and to eventually call them their brothers and sisters in Christ because they treasured Christ more than everything else, including their own lives. Right? So that's how he is able to say he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. Right? All the things of this life, including our own safety, for that which we cannot lose which is the love of God, to be part of his kingdom forever. That is what it looks like to treasure Christ more than everything else in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we have the greatest treasure, the treasure that will never be taken from us, that no government can claim, that can never be taxed, a, a treasure that will last forever. And that treasure is knowing you because of the works that Jesus did on the cross, that we can have a relationship with you and we can be part of the kingdom of heaven where we will get to rule with Jesus forever. And I just pray that that is what our hope is in. That is what our life's pursuits revolve around. And I just pray as we, we go through our daily lives that we will just find ways to live that out where we will express that love that you have given us to everyone around us so we can be a model of what treasuring Christ looks like to others, that we can do that to our family, to our children, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, and that we can encourage them that Christ is a treasure worth pursuing, that he is the only thing that will give us true satisfaction and joy, and all of the other things that we chase after, the things that we think we're searching for, can only be found in knowing you. And as Paul says, that we, we can, that, right, we'll count it all loss as loss because of the surpassing worth of of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And I just pray that that will be our attitude in everything that we do in life. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're able, please join us in standing as we sing our closing hymn, Cleanse Me. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. me. 